This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rainer Obgenrein. Discourse on the Method of Rightly Conducting One's Reason and Seeking by René Descartes. Part 3. And finally, as it is not enough, before commencing to rebuild the house in which we live, that it be pulled down, and materials and builders provided, or that we engage in the work ourselves, according to a plan which we have beforehand carefully drawn out, but, as it is likewise necessary, that we be furnished with some other house in which we may live commodiously during the operations, so that I might not remain irresolute in my actions, while my reason compelled me to suspend my judgment, and that I might not be prevented from living thenceforward in the greatest possible felicity, I formed a provisory code of morals, composed of three or four maxims, with which I am desirous to make you acquainted. The first was to obey the laws and custom of my country, adhering firmly to the faith in which, by the grace of God, I had been educated from my childhood, and regulating my conduct in every other matter, according to the most moderate opinions, and the farthest removed from extremes, which should happen to be adopted in practice with general consent of the most judicious of those among whom I might be living. For as I had, from that time, begun to hold my own opinions for naught, because I wished to subject them all to examination, I was convinced that I could not do better than follow in the meantime the opinions of the most judicious. And although there are some perhaps among the Persians and Chinese as judicious as among ourselves, expediency seemed to dictate that I should regulate my practice conformably to the opinions of those with whom I should have to live. And it appeared to me that, in order to ascertain the real opinions of such, I ought rather to take cognizance of what they practiced than of what they said, not only because, in the corruption of our manners, there are few disposed to speak exactly as they believe, but also because very many are not aware of what it is that they really believe. For, as the act of mind by which a thing is believed is different, from that by which we know that we believe it. The one act is often found without the other. Also, amid many opinions held in equal repute, I choose always the most moderate, as much for the reason that these are always the most convenient for practice, and probably the best, for all excess is generally vicious, as that, in the event of my falling into error, I might be at less distance from the truth than if, having chosen one of the extremes, it should turn out to be the other, which I ought to have adopted. And I placed in the class of extremes, especially all promises, by which somewhat of our freedom is abridged. Not that I disapproved of the laws which, to provide against the instability of man of feeble resolution, when what is sought to be accomplished is some good, permit engagements by vows and contracts binding the parties to persevere in it, or even, for the security of commerce, sanction similar engagements where the purpose sought to be realized is indifferent. But, because I did not find anything on earth which was wholly superior to change, and because for myself in particular I hoped gradually to perfect my judgments and not to suffer them to deteriorate, I would have deemed it a grave sin against good sense, if, for the reason that I approved of something at a particular time, I therefore bound myself to hold it for good at a subsequent time, when perhaps it had ceased to be so, or I had ceased to esteem it such. My second maxim was to be as firm and resolute in my actions as I was able, and not to adhere less steadfastly to the most doubtful opinions, when once adopted, than if they had been highly certain. 
imitating in this the examples of travelers, who, when they have lost their way in a forest, ought not to wander from side to side, far less remain in one place, but proceed constantly towards the same side in as straight a line as possible, without changing their direction for slight reasons, although perhaps it might be chance alone which at first determined the selection. For in this way, if they do not exactly reach the point they desire, they will come, at least in the end, to some place that will probably be preferable to the middle of the forest. In the same way, since in action it frequently happens that no delay is permissible, it is very certain that, when it is not in our power to determine what is true, we ought to act according to what is most probable, and even although we should not remark a greater probability in one opinion than in another, we ought notwithstanding to choose one or the other, and afterwards consider it, in so far as it relates to practice, as no longer dubious, but manifestly true and certain, since the reason by which our choice has been determined is itself possessed of these qualities. This principle was sufficient thenceforward to rid me of all those repentings and pangs of remorse that usually disturb the conscience of such feeble and uncertain minds as, destitute of any clear and determined principle of choice, allow themselves one day to adopt a course of action as the best, which they abandon the next at the opposite. My third maxim was to endeavor always to conquer myself rather than fortune, and change my desires rather than the order of the world, and in general accustom myself to the persuasion that, except our own thoughts, there is nothing absolutely in our power, so that when we have done our best in things external to us, all wherein we fail of success is to be held as regards us, absolutely impossible. And this single principle seemed to me sufficient to prevent me from desiring for the future anything which I could not obtain, and such render me contented. For since our will naturally seeks those objects alone, which the understanding represents as in some way possible of attainment, it is plain that if we consider all external goods as equally beyond our power, we shall no more regret the absence of such goods as seem due to our birth, when deprived of them without any faults of ours, than our not possessing the kingdoms of China or Mexico, and thus making, so to speak, a virtue of necessity. We shall no more desire health and disease, or freedom in imprisonment, than we now do bodies incorruptible as diamonds, or the wings of birds to fly with. But I confess, there is need of prolonged discipline, and frequently repeated meditation, to accustom the mind to view all objects in this light. And I believe, that in this chiefly consisted the secret of the power of such philosophers, as in former times, were enabled to rise superior to the influence of fortune, and, amid suffering and poverty, enjoy a happiness which their gods might have envied. For, occupied incessantly with the consideration of the limits prescribed to their power by nature, they became so entirely convinced that nothing was at their disposal except their own thoughts. That this conviction was of itself sufficient to prevent their entertaining any desire of other objects, and over their thoughts they acquired a sway so absolute that they had some ground on this account for esteeming themselves more rich and more powerful, more free and more happy than other men who, whatever be the favors heaped on them by nature and fortune, if destitute of this philosophy, can never command the realization of all their desires. In fine, to conclude this code of morals, I thought of reviewing the different occupations of man in this life, with the view of making choice of the best. And, 
without wishing to offer any remarks on the employments of others, I may state that it was my conviction that I could not do better than continue in that in which I was engaged, viz. in devoting my whole life to the culture of my reason, and in making the greatest progress I was able in the knowledge of truth on the principles of the methods which I had prescribed to myself. This method, from the time I had begun to apply it, had been to me the source of satisfaction so intense as to lead me to believe that more perfect or more innocent could not be enjoyed in this life, and as by its means I daily discovered truths that appeared to me of some importance, and of which other men were generally ignorant, the gratification thence arising so occupied my mind that I was wholly indifferent to every other object. Besides, the three preceding maxims were founded singly on the design of continuing the work of self-instruction. For since God has endowed each of us with some light of reason by which to distinguish truth from error, I could not have believed that I ought for a single moment to rest satisfied with the opinions of another, unless I had resolved to exercise my own judgment in examining these whenever I should be duly qualified for the task. Nor could I have proceeded on such opinions without scruple, had I supposed that I should thereby forfeit any advantage for attaining still more accurate should such exist. And, in fine, I could not have restrained my desires, nor remained satisfied, had I not followed a path in which I sought myself certain of attaining all the knowledge to the acquisition of which I was competent, as well as the largest amount of what is truly good, which I could ever hope to secure, inasmuch as we neither seek nor shun any object except in so far as our understanding represents it as good or bad. All that is necessary to right action is right judgment, and to the best action the most correct judgment, that is, to the acquisition of all the virtues with all else that is truly valuable and within our reach, and the assurance of such an acquisition cannot fail to render us contented. Having thus provided myself with these maxims, and having placed them in reserve along with the truths of faith which have ever occupied the first place in my belief, I came to the conclusion that I might, with freedom set about, ridding myself of what remained of my opinions, and, inasmuch as I hoped to be better able successfully to accomplish this work by holding intercourse with mankind, than by remaining longer shut up in the retirement where these thoughts had occurred to me, I betook me again to traveling before the winter was well ended. And during the nine subsequent years I did nothing but roam from one place to another, desirous of being a spectator rather than an actor in the plays exhibited on the theater of the world, and as I made it my business in each matter to reflect particularly upon what might fairly be doubted and prove a source of error, I gradually rooted out from my mind all the errors which had hitherto crept into it. Not that in this I imitated the skeptics, who doubt only that they may doubt, and seek nothing beyond uncertainty itself. For, on the contrary, my design was singly to find ground of assurance, and cast aside the loose earth and sand, that I might reach the rock or the clay. In this, as appears to me, I was successful enough. For, since I endeavored to discover the falsehood or incertitude of the propositions I examined, not by feeble conjectures, but by clear and certain reasonings, I met with nothing so doubtful as not to yield some conclusion or adequate certainty. 
although this were merely the inference that the matter in question contained nothing certain. And, just as in pulling down an old house, we usually reserve the ruins to contribute towards the erection, so, in destroying such of my opinions as I judged to be ill-founded, I made a variety of observations and acquired an amount of experience of which I availed myself in the establishment of more certain. And further, I continued to exercise myself in the method I had prescribed. For, besides taking care in general to conduct all my thoughts according to its rules, I reserved some hours from time to time which I expressly devoted to the employment of the method in the solution of mathematical difficulties, or even in the solution likewise of some questions belonging to other sciences, but which, by my having detached them from such principles of these sciences, as were of inadequate certainty, were rendered almost mathematical. The truth of this will be manifest from the numerous examples contained in this volume, and thus, without in appearance living otherwise than those who, with no other occupation than that of spending the lives agreeably and innocently, study to sever pleasure from vice, and who, that they may enjoy the leisure without ennui, have recourse to such pursuits as are honorable. I was nevertheless prosecuting my design and making greater progress in the knowledge of truth than I might, perhaps, have made had I been engaged in the perusal of books merrily or in holding converse with men of letters. These nine years passed away, however, before I had come to any determinate judgment respecting the difficulties which form matter of dispute among the learned, or had commenced to seek the principles of any philosophy more certain than the vulgar. And the examples of many men of the highest genius, who had, in former times, engaged in this inquiry, but, as appeared to me, without success, led me to imagine it to be a work of so much difficulty, that I would not perhaps have ventured on it so soon, had I not heard it currently rumored that I had already completed the inquiry. I know not what were the grounds of this opinion, and, if my conversation contributed in any measure to its rise, this must have happened rather from my having confessed my ignorance with greater freedom than those are accustomed to do who have studied a little, and expounded perhaps the reason that led me to doubt of many of those things that by others are esteemed certain than from my having boasted of any system of philosophy. But as I am of a disposition that makes me unwilling to be esteemed different from what I really am, I thought it necessary to endeavor by all means to render myself worthy of the reputation accorded to me. And it is now exactly eight years since this desire constrained me to remove from all those places where interruption of any of my acquaintances was possible, and betake myself to this country, in which the long duration of the war has led to the establishment of such discipline that the armies maintained seem to be of use only in enabling the inhabitants to enjoy more securely the blessings of peace and where in the midst of a great crowd actively engaged in business and more careful with their own affairs than curious about those of others, I have been enabled to live without being deprived of any of the conveniences to be had in the most populous cities, and yet as solitary and as retired as in the midst of the most remote deserts. End of part three.